Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're so excited you could join us. Um, we are moving on to our next chapter in Literacy Foundations for English Learners. So if you are with us tonight, this is the book, hopefully, that you were able to, to purchase so that we can talk along. I know that um, Dr. Neister is going to be talking about a few things in his chapter tonight. We're going to be working on phonics, which is fantastic. We're very excited to hear his expertise around phonics. Uh, Ken Neeser is the, a project manager, manager for the Texas Institute for Measurement, Evaluation, and Statistics at the University of Houston. He has more than 30 years of experience in elementary bilingual education. Ken has worked on numerous national research projects that focus on a various aspects of early literacy. He has presented at national, state, regional, and local conferences for literacy. Ken is a national trainer for the Tejas Lee Spanish Reading Assessment and for Esperanza a Spanish language and literacy program. So we are very honored he is joining us tonight to talk about what the chapter. And we are also joined, of course, by Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen. She is here tonight as well. Um, and there's a few others on the call that we're very excited that yeah. we're able to join us. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and put up the uh, PowerPoint, uh, Elsa. Yeah, thank you. And as we were, you all missed the discussion that we were having earlier about the pronunciations of everyone's names and where they come from and the history of languages and, and how languages uh, evolve. And so as you look here, uh, we know that the purpose of, you know, what we're trying to get is really getting at that knowledge base for describing to you the evidence that we know of today for working with English learners and understanding um, understanding that language and literacy development, uh, making sure that we're differentiating our instruction for our students um, that are English learners and thinking about the strategies and activities that will really help them to achieve literacy and strengthen their academic achievement. So tonight's topic is really looking at uh, phonics development amongst uh, English learners and some strategies and things that we have to think about and, and uh, implement as we work uh, with our students. Okay, so what I thought I'd do is to start off by um, sharing with you guys a video that perhaps will give you a little bit of more empathy for your ELLs in your classroom as they struggle to learn English. And this is a very old video. Some of you may have seen it from I Love Lucy, and I hope you guys enjoy it. It's about five minutes long. I hope you guys enjoyed that as a kind of a segue into our, our section tonight on phonics. So <clears throat> I'm gonna start out by talking about the difference between phonological awareness and phonics, because I don't, I don't know if uh, any of you had the same confusion, but when I was in the classroom, I would go to these presentations on early literacy and language, and they would talk about phonics and they would talk about phonological awareness, and they would give me definitions, but when the training was over, I was never clear on what the actual difference was between them. So what I learned when I, when I went over to the research side is someone gave me a very, very simple definition of the two that, that showed me the difference in a way that was clear and it stuck with me. And I use it whenever I do a training like this to help people understand that difference. So phonological awareness is an auditory skill. It's all about the sounds. You can rhyme, you can do alliteration, you can blend and segment sounds, you can omit sounds, you can change the order of sounds and do all kinds of different things with them, but it's strictly auditory. So that if the lights were to go off in your classroom and it was pitch black, you could still do phonological awareness activities with your kids. You could have them blend, segment, rhyme, all in the dark with any, any light. But phonics on the other hand, is <clears throat> all about the words. It's the reading of words through the use of letters and digraphs and their associated sounds. So it's both visual and auditory. So you need to see the letters in order to do phonics. And that's the main difference. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing the screen again here. And give me just a second to put this on full screen. There we go. Okay, 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about each of the different components of the, cha the chapter on phonics and talk a little bit about the importance and the definition of the different things. Letter recognition is the first thing we discuss in the book. And that's fairly straightforward in terms of its meaning. But I always wonder when I was in the class, well, well, what, why do we teach the kids the names of the letter? How does that help them to read? I can understand the sounds, but what about why do we teach them the name? Why is it important for them to learn the names? But what research has shown is that kids in kindergarten, when they're learning to recognize letter, uh, letter names, that is an excellent predictor of their code decoding ability in grade one. The better they are at naming letters, the better they are at decoding. Furthermore, letter recognition is an important step in recognizing letter patterns and an instant recognition of names. So when they're working on their letter recognition, they're also working on their automaticity. Graphophonemic knowledge is that letter sound correspondences. It's the understanding that sound or sounds, more than one, are associated with each graphing, whether that be a letter, a digraph, or a combination of letters. Decoding is the translating of words from print to speech. And if we do this, we're trying to develop proficiency at this in them, because as kids get better in their accuracy and in their speed, their automaticity, they begin to develop a knowledge of sight words and recognition of words. And they're able to do larger chunks. And when they're able to read larger chunks of print, they're able to free up cognitive abilities, which allows them to attend to the meaning of print. Finally, we'll be talking a little bit about morphology. Morphology deals with morphemes, which are, morphology deals with meaning. You know, we all know that a phoneme is the smallest unit of sound. Well, a morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in the language. So if you take the word, for example, cats, is comprised of two, phone, uh, two morphemes. Cat, the word, the object, the animal, and then the final S, which tells us more than one. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the how phonics works with English language learners. So both phonics and phonological awareness skills are very similar across languages. And what that means for us as teachers, and what's really good about that, is that we can use the child's native language, their first language, to teach English to them if that child has a strong literacy foundation in their first language. The more they know about their native languages, the more we can use that to teach them English. And there's two aspects of this, what we call transfer, that are important to consider when you're thinking about languages and how we can use them. One is that some languages are considered to be transparent, while others are considered to be opaque. In a transparent languages, there are lots of regular rules and few exceptions. There are a lot of one-on-one -on -one correspondences in letters to sounds, and this helps kids to read easier. Some languages that are considered to be transparent or languages like Spanish, Italian, Russian, Finnish. And that is very helpful when you're learning to read a language. Other languages like English are considered to be opaque where there are a lot of combinations where one letter can be represented by many, many sounds or a, a sing, a, lots of sounds can be mapped onto a single letter. And English is an example of an opaque language. The second consideration for transfer is how much overlap there is between languages. So for most of our students who are Spanish speakers, at least in many, I'm assuming in most of your classrooms that will be true, there's a tremendous amount of overlap between English and Spanish because of the common roots of the language. English is based about 60% on and Latin and Greek root words. Spanish is based about 85% on those same roots. So there are thousands and thousands of words that have similar spellings, pronunciations, and meanings between them. And our alphabets are very similar. So we get a lot of overlap between them. So when we're talking about phonics and English learners, we wanna talk about 
the components for instru uh, in effective instruction. And this would include us being systematic and explicit in our instruction. Remember, these kids are new to language. You saw the frustrations that Ricky had in the video. So we want to make sure that we're, we're laying the foundation for them, making it easy for them to understand it. We always want to introduce and model new concepts before we move on to the next one. We often talk about the I learn, uh, I do, we do, you do model. But often what it ends up being is I do, then we do, and I see you haven't gotten it. And we go back and it becomes more like I do, we do, I do, I do, I do, we do. And then finally, you do when I know that you got it. <clears throat> and you also want to start simple. Start at the simple level. And then as the kids master those, move on to and add more complexity to what you're teaching. So the considerations that you want to take with English language learners is pointing out the similarities between the languages. If you don't have to necessarily speak the language, but you, what you want to do is you want to do some research into it and find out about the languages that the students in your classroom speak. And with that, you can use with your knowledge of their language to show them where those two languages are similar and where they, di where they, where they diverge. You also want to, when you find where the languages diverge, you want to teach that systematically, okay? Now, there's another way you can do it. There's two, uh, I was saying there's the one way is to learn about the language. One great website in, that you can use in order to learn about over a hundred different languages is a website called mylanguages.org. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and change right now and share that with you so you can just see that for a moment. And let me move to that for a second. And as you can see, it has a list of numerous, numerous languages that you can cl click into to learn a little bit about those languages. One of the ones I find that is most um, helpful is the alphabet. So I'm gonna pick one that is totally different from, um, from English, which is Ar Armenian. And what I found, I looked at this the other day and it's frozen. Here, okay, here it is. So the alphabet is, there's gonna be very, very little overlap because the alphabet is totally different from English. But what is nice is that it has for each one of the letters, how it's pronounced in English, the English equivalent. So you can show where they have that in their language and what that letter looks like if they're literate. And if we scroll down here, I actually found one letter where we have overlap. The letter O maps onto the long O in English, the O like in bone. So there's even areas where we get some complete overlap in a, in a language as different from English as Armenian. Now, the resources available for each one of the languages is different. There's not a lot for Armenian, as you can see, but there's plenty of information so you can become a little bit familiar should you have a child who speaks Armenian in your classroom and to learn a little bit about their language and how it works and how you can take what that child may know in their native language and map it onto English instruction. For other of the languages like Spanish, the amount of information there is tremendous, okay? So I just wanted you guys to be aware of that, that uh, website, mylanguages.org. And I think it's, it would be a great helpful resource for you. Dr. Neeser, yes. we have a question. Would this be considered a phony or a, I'm sorry, a tra language transfer chart? Um, I think it, 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 that part one I shared was definitely a language transfer chart. You were showing what the representation in the native language and in how it will be pronounced in English. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Anything so you I want think, to I think. I think I think that really gets to the point of uh, what you mentioned in that we, you know, we as instructors uh, may have students with, you know, varied languages, but that should not inhibit us from trying to learn about 
you know, that overlap and about those similarities and those differences. And, you know, I really like that in that um, it'll show you, well, it's almost like, it's like this sound. And so that's something to connect to for the English language. And so I think, you know, some, many of you've mentioned like, oh, we have 20 different languages in our school. And, uh, and we know that there's 400 different languages spoken in the homes of our English learners. And so um, this, you know, can certainly really open our eyes to how we can um, really meet the needs of our students. So thanks for sharing. Yeah. And, you know, well, another thing is, even if you don't have the, the time to look up for every language in your classroom, you can certainly ask your students, um, you know, do you have that sound in English, in your language? How is it written? And they can draw the, the similarities between the languages themselves. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about a couple of the, the different ways that you can go through this. I've, I've already gone through this slide pretty much is that you teach systematically and explicitly, begin with simple concepts, progress then to more concepts, and use direct instruction that I do, we do, you do. Okay. So let's talk more specifically now about teaching phonics. So the first thing, the most simple level will be letter knowledge, teaching that. And you want to teach kids about how their native languages and the English are different. So if, you have, if you're doing a group with Spanish speakers, you would mention that English has 26 letters and those 26 letters in the English alphabet represent 44 different sounds. And clearly that means that some letters have to do double duty. They're at least double duty. Spanish, on the other hand, has 30 letters or digraphs that map onto only 22 sounds. So it's clear that Spanish, that the one-on-one -on -one trans correspondence of letters to sounds is more direct. So how would you teach <clears throat> letter recognition? One of the things we would want to do, a couple of ideas would be, when you are reciting the alphabet, have each child to have their own alphabet strip in front of them and have them touch the letters as they recite the alphabet. You can also have them have plastic letters or um, cut out letters, have them put them in order and then recite the alphabet. And they can use the alphabet strips that are on their desk, the model, or the alphabet strip in the classroom as a model of how to put them in order. You can talk to them about the letters before and the letters after. So I said, this is the letter C. What is the letter before C? This is the letter M. What's the letter after M? And when you're doing this, you want to encourage them to answer in full sentences because we want to also be building their vocabulary at the same time. Another thing that you can do to help teach the letter, rec letter name recognition is the game of guess who, where you think of a letter, you don't tell the students what letter that is, and you have them ask you yes or no questions only so that they can try and figure out what letter it is that you're, you're, uh, you are thinking of. So you, you might start with simple, and you'll have to model this for them, especially with younger kids, what types of questions they can ask. Is it a vowel or is it a consonant? Is it a tall letter? Or is it a short letter? Is it, the, is it before the letter M, after the letter, letter M? You can have, if you've taught them about voicing, you can have them put their, their uh, ask questions about whether the, le the sound is voiced or unvoiced. And as you play this game more with the kids, you'll see they'll become much more strategic at asking those questions and much better at figuring out the letter that you're, you're thinking of quickly. So uh, anything you want to add there, Elsa? Um, yeah, I just want to add another point. And also, I, you know, I, you know, work with children with disabilities. And so one of the things it was specifically, you know, with um, dyslexia, and one of the things I want to point out there is as you're speaking about this letter recognition and being able to do so, what you're describing is being able to do so with automaticity. 
And what we know about children that are, you know, the prediction value of, you know, are these children going to have difficulties in the future will be having that rapid naming and being able to do that with automaticity. And so when you were mentioning, you know, what's the letter before this letter and after this letter, I could picture some of my students with disabilities and they have to go all the way back to the letter A to get to tell me what letter is after this letter or before this letter. And um, so I think, I think as you speak, it's not only um, being able to know the letters, it's also being able to say them in a sequence and it's able to, it's also that ability to have that rapid naming and that rapid naming of that really tells us a lot about um, these students and kind of risk factors, that rapid naming. Okay, thank you. That's a great advice. So let's move on a little to graphophonic knowledge now. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through a procedure that we outline in the book. And this is just a, a technique for helping kids to learn a new sound. So the it's just five simple steps. You say as a teacher, three words that begin with a common sound. The students repeat those three words. Then they think about it and they figure out what that common sound is. Then you lead a discussion around the formation of the sound and its features. And then you would talk about the commonalities or the differences of the sound, the, the focus sound, and the children's native languages and the second language. Okay, so let me just walk you through an example to show what this looks like because that may be a little bit uh, abstract. So listen to these three words with a common initial sound ball bus, boot. Now say them aloud, everyone. Ball, bus, boot. What was the common sound you heard? And of course they would respond, b. So then you would invite them, let's look at each other, or if you're doing virtual, let's look in a mirror as you determine how you pronounce, produce that sound. You used your lips, touch your throat, and see if your vocal cords vibrate. They actually do. So that b sound is a consonant sound that is voiced, our vocal cords vibrate. The letter name is b and the sound is b. Now, let's determine if this is a sound you have in your native languages. For example, for those of you who speak Spanish, you have the sound b. It's the same sound as the English sound. It's also voiced consonant in Spanish. We can use the word bat to help us remember this sound. In Spanish, the word bat would be bate. Say the letter name in English, B. And say the key word, bat. Say the B sound, everyone, B. Good job. So it just walks them through and, and makes, simplifies it and provides a lot of scaffolding for them to learn the letters. And one thing I do want to mention when you're working at the phoneme level is the importance of pronouncing pure phonemes. I went to great efforts as I was pronouncing that b sound to not add a schwa at the end, that vowel sound, because we want to produce that sound as pure as we can, b rather than b. Okay, and that's true for all of the letters. So when you're working on um, letter sounds, be sure you're pronouncing those very, very pure sounds to help your students to learn them. Anything you wanted there, Elsa? Uh, no, I think I think that's um, um, and one of the things. Just here, um, Ken. One of the things I think about is you mentioned, you know, the forty-four new sounds. And you spoke about, well, some of these other languages have much fewer sounds in their language. And so there's going to be new sounds and that there's some overlap. And, you know, I'm a speech and language pathologist. And I think about how oftentimes English learners might not have the precision and the opportunity for the precision of the sounds. And so you're mentioning that we have to model and do so enunciate. And I, I'm very mindful uh, with my teaching voice, my teaching rate, and I am very mindful of helping our students to actually have that perfect production. And so when you're describing those features, how they process the sounds, how they produce the sounds, 
are, that's going to be how they read, write, and spell them. So this is essential to get that with precision. Nothing wrong with having an accent. We all have accents, but there is a, <clears throat> something that we must achieve, and that is the precision of those sounds. And we're not gonna get them into speech and language therapy because it's not really a disorder. It's a part of the learning of the second language, and it's a part of building that ear to get used to all of these new sounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a couple questions that have come in sure. in the chat, if this is a good spot. Yeah, this is a good spot. So um, one question is, in the chart on page 66 in the book, in order to be consistent, shouldn't our digraphs and affricates also be listed? Examples being pH, CH, TH, SH, and the voiced equivalents to some of those sounds. On page 66, I don't know which chart you're referring to. It's the English and Spanish alphabets that are written there. Oh yeah, yeah. so yeah, so it's the alphabet. Yeah, it's right at the bottom of the page. So there's that, there's, you know, the double L, the Enya. Oh, oh, oh. So that, that's just showing these, this is the English alphabet and this is the Spanish alphabet. Okay. And it's just looking at the alphabets and making the comparison amongst the two alphabets. And thank you. No. That makes yeah, sense. I was going to say, I think that the confusion comes is in that CH, like why would that be represent, poten represented potentially in the Spanish alphabet, but not in the English alphabet? Yeah. So it's interesting that you mentioned that because the Spanish um, and the Real Academia, they've actually taken out after hundreds and hundreds of years, they actually have removed the Che, the AJ, and um, the um, double R. The, oh, they've re sorry, they've removed the C, the digraph CH, the Ls, and the double R. But you know, when you're teaching reading, I, you know, I was like, why after hundreds of years would you take away letters from the alphabet? Because what was the beauty of the Spanish language is here we have it, and this is all these words that have it, and it's not like in English. In English, we have that digraph CH, but you know, uh, we have it when it comes. Uh, from the Greek, where it's going to say the sound, or from the French, where it's going to say sh, right? And, and so, um, very interesting, and, you know, I do work in Spain, and when I worked over there, I thought, oh my god, all of, you know, they're going to be talking about how we shouldn't be doing these letters, and you know that all the teachers are like, we're so glad you didn't take those out. We still teach them because they're so important. This is how they learn. They learn, it, that's if you take them away for the Spanish language, it takes away the one-to-one -one letter to sound mapping. And then it makes it more opaque than, than being consistent like it already was. And so we, what we do is we highlight them and tell them, you know, you're not gonna find these things in a, these kind of consonant digraphs anymore in the alphabet. You're not gonna find them if you're using a diction. Mary, but it certainly makes sense because of the transparency of the language to keep that in. And do you recommend um, letter naming fluency assessment with RELs? And would you recommend that for benchmarks and or progress so, monitoring or? So what I was trying to get at was, I mean, we don't, see, one of the things that drives me crazy is, like, and, and next week, you know, uh, Dr. Carlson will be talking about fluency, but one of the things that drive me crazy is that we're going to do fluency probe and it's like almost every day and so I don't want this to go overboard and test 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 it needs to be treat 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 teach 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 right and so one of the things that you know if I'm looking at it from the point of view of I want to rule out you know um, whether the child's going to be at risk those are kind of when I'm talking about the rapid naming that's kind of just a, a factor and so that might just take you know I might just do a little you know it's like a little minute activity let's see how we can do it you've been learning the alphabet so now let's look and see if how you do that letter naming and you know and eventually could we do that you know, could you tell me the sounds that they make and can I read those words? Um, and, and uh, but the hardest one for students, for example, that uh, are at risk or have dyslexia will be where we have those pictures and where they have to tell you and name those pictures out of a sequence. And that's what we see in our um, work that we do um, with these students. So I, I just don't want things to go overboard and test, test, test. Let's teach, teach, teach. And um, two more brief questions. One is, how would you explain to kids to quote unquote, turn on their voice box or their voice? Yeah. 
So, so one of the things, so if you put your hand right here on your vocal cords, let's just blow air, like with that sound for P. You're, you're, you're not feeling any vibration. But now I want you to say that very same sound. But now we're going to say it with a lot of force and you're going to turn it on. And now we're going to say, turn your voice box off, turn it on. And oftentimes, why do we confuse the P and the B? We don't discriminate that one is my voice box is not vibrating. And th those are called the minimal pairs of sounds. And so we have these minimal pairs and, um, you know, and that often is at the root, that auditory discrimination of sound is at the root of why they're not reading, writing and spelling correctly. And so using those minimal pairs activities or the voice voiceless uh, sounds um, that could be uh, really um, helpful. And the last is that somebody um, put in the chat that they had a specific student that only knows the letter name if you say a word with that sound. Have you heard of that? And do you have a solution? So, so this, uh, so as we get it, so remember what Ken was saying? I do, we do, I do, we do, I do, we do, we do, we do, um, you know, Oftentimes when you work with uh, students who struggle as I work with them each and every day, we, you will find, and, and, and part of it is, you know, we did, we're not talking about some of the cognitive issues. So part of it is, you know, we, uh, you know, there might be some attention issues, there might be some memory issues. And so what are the things that we can do to get around those? And what are the strategies that we use um, for their attention, for mm -hmm. their concentration, for their memory, and for what we call their working memory? And so uh, it might be that, yeah, so first I'm gonna do it with it and now we're gonna do without, we're gonna do it with it without and then we're gonna just be practicing it. And maybe you use a, a shorter set, you know what I'm saying where you, uh, you know, I had one student who was, you know, severely cognitively impaired and, and, uh, and I'm telling you to get through just knowing A, B and C, you know, took a month, right? But we got it and we, you know, so, it's like we had to do a lot more repetition rehearsal for you know those students who are really on the very severe um, part of that continuum. And so it might be that you have to close the set a little bit more and really work on the memories, make sure they've got the attention and the memory strategies for that and don't have such a large set. So I, you know, for that student, I didn't do the whole alphabet. I just did the first few letters till we really got that down. Then we're gonna do another section. We're gonna put that together. So just step by step by step and just realizing that they are making progress. It may not be at the rate that we're accustomed to, but it still is progress. All right, so I'm gonna head back into what we were talking about with the GK procedures. And one of the thing I wanted to talk about, one of those the great advantages of learning about the students' languages is you will quickly note, note which ones have full overlap that have the same letter and the same sound representation in both languages. You, with those letters, you can speed through them if they're fluent in the initial, in, in their first language, because they already know those sounds and they know those letters. And what you want to focus in on is where the two languages diverge. In some cases, you may have what we call partial overlap, where a letter is the same representation but carries a different sound. For example, in the book, we mentioned that the sound C, the letter C in English obviously has the either the s sound or the k sound. But in Zulu, it's pronounced as ch. So we can show a Zulu speaker that you have this letter in your language. But when you're reading English words, you have to be careful because the pronunciation will be different. And then finally, we wanna focus in on those words that are gonna be the, the sounds that are gonna be the hardest for them when they, the sound doesn't exist in their language and there'll be no overlap. So we'll have to teach those especially systematically and explicitly to them to make sure they learn those novel sounds. So I'm gonna put back on the screen share here. Give me just a second, please. Okay, let that go away so I can share the screen. There we go. 
And so now we're going to move on to decoding. And decoding is where students will sound out and blend those sounds. And as they're doing this, they are listening in their brain to see if they get a match with their lexicon. And that is why it's really important as we're teaching phonics to also be asking them to respond in sentences so that they're also building the vocabulary. Because the student might be able to read the word cart, but if it's not part of their vocabulary, they have no idea whether they've read that word correctly or incorrectly. When that word is in their lexicon, they get validation and they know that their decoding of that word was accurate and they can move on to the next word. As part of decoding, we want to move on to, um, it went back to, here we go, to the six syllable types and their connect, connections across languages. What is wonderful about English is even though there's lots and lots of exceptions and to the rules, many, many thousands of words can be decoded by English learners by simply teaching them the six syllable types. Those six syllable types, and I'm gonna go through them one at a time. The first one is open, like in the word B, B-E. In an open syllable, it ends in a vowel and that vowel is pronounced long. Once students have learned that, you can teach them about closed syllables, which end in a consonant such as the word cat. When a, when a uh, syllable is short, that the vowel sound is also short, and that's a great regular rule. The third type, syllable type is the vowel pair, or vowel teams, where two vowels are together. And usually the first one is um, the one that is pronounced, but not always. So we tell them that with vowel pairs, you have to treat them with care and learn the rules for their pronunciation. The fourth syllable type is the vowel R, which is the, the R controlled syllables, in, where you have the AR, which is usually pronounced R when it's in the stressed syllable and is pronounced ER when it's in the unstressed syllable. So like in a word like charter, you've got that stress syllable char and it's pronounced R. But in a word like dollar, that AR sound at the end because it's in the unstressed syllable becomes an ER. That same rule applies to OR in the stressed syllable, we pronounce it OR. When it's in the unstressed syllable, we pronounce it ER. So you have words like word and a word like doctor. And then ER, IR and UR are always pronounced the same, er. So there's some dependable rules that they can use to decode thousands of words with that syllable type. The next syllable type would, would be the vowel consonant silent E. And for a lot of languages, I'm thinking of Portuguese, I'm thinking of Spanish and French. That's also a very common pattern in those languages, but the pronunciation of those is very different. While in English, that final E becomes silent and makes the vowel long, in Spanish, there's no such rule for that. So Spanish speakers, when they see a word like kite, they want to pronounce it quite, because that's how you would pronounce it in Spanish. So we have to explicitly teach that type of, that syllable type, so they're able to pronounce it correctly. And then the final of the six syllable types is the final stable ending. That would be a BLE, GLE, DLE, where they, you learn that stem and it's always pronounced the same. Those are just a couple of quick examples of those. But the great thing with these, once students have learned these syllable types and begin to apply them, they could read thousands of novel words. And knowledge of the six syllable types is a great uh, scaffold for reading multi-syllable words where a lot of kids become frustrated if they don't have that knowledge and either try to skip or guess at multi-syllable words. The six syllable types gives them a lot of confidence that they actually know about those. And for the last part, I'm gonna turn it over to Elsa to finish the discussion on the items on this slide. Yeah, so 
um, as we as we look um, as we look at this, you know, uh, we think and there's like you know, should we be teaching these syllable types? But you know, it really helps English learners in the structure to know the structure of the language and to know how it works. And what I you know like to do is when they have those open and closed syllables that we show the differences between you know me and met right. Uh, <clears throat> and he and him. So that's very important. And, and I like to do activities where we can do word sorts and put them into the different syllable types. But I also think later as we talk uh, on with chapter nine on spelling, we're going to be looking at this and thinking about that pattern. As Ken was mentioning, he was talking about going from simple to complex. Do you know that uh, when he was talking about, you know, you work on the letters and sounds, you move to the syllables, then you're looking at the syllables types and you're reading those words. And then he was talking about the morphological awareness and talking to you about morphemes as having those small units of meaning, um, the smallest unit of meaning in a language. What well, made me think about when we think about, well, that, you know, we're, we're applying that process to reading, but it's also a process that we apply um, to, to when we're thinking about spelling and writing. And as we think about that, we think about the developmental progression. And what we're trying to get at is showing you that th th these are these early stages. And as we you know, move through reading stages, you get to these higher levels where you're really thinking about those patterns within words. And so when we think about syllable division, we're thinking about those patterns, right? The, you know, one of the most common patterns is that vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel. Well, what the heck do I do with that word, right? It's going to have more than one syllable. Well, the most common thing for you to do is divide between the two consonants. And this is a pattern that we see. And as you saw in our last chapter, we talked about some of the similarities in these patterns of these syllables. We see that in many languages. And so this should make sense to them. And I think what we're trying to get at is in everything that you do, we want to make those connections, right? Those connections across languages. And so that vowel consonant consonant vowel pattern, well, we're going to divide between the two consonants and that that makes that first vowel what? It makes it short because it ends in a consonant and that vowel will be short. It didn't end in the vowel. Or we have that vowel consonant vowel. Well, what did that happen? Well, that made that vowel long and we typically divide after that first uh, vowel. And so, uh, and then we get even more complex with the vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel syllable division pattern. And what are we going to do this? We're going to find those vowels. We're going to look. And then we, when we divide it, what's hard for the English learner is when you say, um, does that, is that a word that looks familiar to you or <laughs> sounds familiar to you? And they're going to go, no, uh, I don't have an experience with that word. So, you know, all the while that we're doing this work, we cannot, cannot forget that we want to bring in the language and the proficiency and the vocabulary. We always want to extend. Yeah, I'm focused on ph phonics, but it's not working in a silo, right? I'm going to be working to where I'm always thinking about those phonological features, that those features for the morphology, those features for the grammar and the meaning. Uh, that's going to be very important for uh, our students. And <clears throat> as you see in the book, and that's one of the things that <clears throat> I, was so uh, very important to me, that we really capitalize upon the similarities and looking at the best, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, the best word learning strategies are this morphological awareness, but it helps us. The morphological awareness and knowing these word parts helps us for decoding and it helps us for reading, it helps us for writing and it helps us for spelling. And so this is essential for our students. And while we're doing that, we can be building the oral language proficiency. And you heard Ken mention to you that um, as we're as we're always doing this, we're always asking for that expressive language. I'm making sure that they understood and making sure that they um, got to um, also express and having those multiple, multiple opportunities uh, for use. And as always, I just now see that we're like 10 minutes till, and I really want to get into, um, you know, just, we kind of ended with not only, like when I, you have the example of the word parts and the main thing there, once again, hey, I got to know my students. Is this something you already know in your language? Does it have the same connotation? Because, you know, different words in different languages, <laughs> we were talking about this, weren't we, Ken? 
how even words within a language, and we were talking about Spanish language, and I was saying how some person said this was a bad word in Spanish. I go, oh my God, I never heard it in that context. Get your head out of the gutter, right? But but even within languages, um, you will find that there's different connotations and different uh, ways, like different in, uh, intensity and uh, different, like, you know, I, oh, I, I don't want to say because then it'll be a bad word. But anyway, so so what I want to say is be careful about the words. We want to teach all the connotations. So and we also want to teach the precision and about some of the words like uh, like, for example, if if I were um, talking about I had a problem, you know, so a problem was it a catastrophe? Or was it a glitch? And so, you know, words have intensity and there's particular words that you use at a particular time. And so I think, you know, we can't forget about the word learning uh, that we're, as we're working. And every time, even if we're working on decoding, we're always bringing in language and comprehension and vocabulary into what we do. This chapter was focused on phonics. And so we taught you how, you know, Ken taught you about how we go about this work, but it's never done in a silo. And I want to get that message, you know, across. So let's open it up for questions. I have three currently right now. Okay. Um, I've noticed that while Spanish and English share more phonemes than some other languages, my um, this person's Spanish students will tend to make up the majority of their long-term English learning students. Why do you think that is? So what was the last part of that? Well, the why do you think that, that it is that way? why some of the Spanish speaking or long-term students? More long-term, even though Spanish and English share yeah. phonemes. So can I be rude about it? <laughs> so, you know, I won't be rude, but I, I always feel like they just would do this instead of doing this. What have I done? What has our system done? Where's the equity? Where's the opportunity? Where's the consistency and the systematic? And and I might have given this discussion and uh, you know before, but uh, you know we in one of our research projects, it was a five-year longitudinal study, and in those five years, that school system changed their language of instruction model five times five times and they didn't do it like we're going to start with kindergarten and then no it's every okay drop everything and redo drop everything and redo so this is this is these are gaps and are we you know depending on when they when they arrive at school how much they got uh you know I talked to you about native language and how important that is and how people that have that native language instruction will outperform those that have English only we know that and we've known that for a very long time so I, um, um, you know, I just want to tell you, I work with the most severe children and all the students I work with are literate. I'm just going to tell you that. And by the way, I work with students that have extreme cognitive deficits. I can teach a Down syndrome student to read, a child with Down syndrome. I can teach a child with autism to read. I can teach a child with cerebral palsy to read. I can teach an English learner to read. And all my students who are dyslexic, they are bilingual proficient in the end. And so I can't accept what you're telling me. I just can't. Yeah, I think the real key is that when kids are not being successful, we have to examine our own instruction first. Are we giving them what they need in the way they need to learn it? And the more we can do that, the less of that long-term problem we're going to have. And most kids, given the appropriate instruction, will overcome any deficits and will become successful readers. And we have about 3% that we call our resistors but even our resistors, our most severe children, like I was saying, if we look at it very carefully, they also are still making progress. It's not at the rate that you would want, but it's still progress. And um, so I think we need to take a good look at what, and I think, you know, this pandemic has really um, exposed the inequality and the issue with access and opportunity. 
but it's also given us some wonderful opportunities because now we're able to reach out to more people than ever before. And, um, you know, I might have mentioned to you how we've had to, I think I mentioned to you how we had to roll up our sleeves. And right before this session, I was working with a, a, a student also with um, autism. And, and, you know, like I said, family came to me last semester and fall and said, my child, you know, can't talk. And sure enough, can you do the assessment? And, you know, now the child is speaking. And had I said, no, I can't do anything right now, not under these conditions then, you know, the children with the most need are the ones that we need to figure out and we need to roll up our sleeves and be creative and really think about what we've done. And sometimes it's the whole system and, um, and, and we're not knowing well enough. What did, what did they have? What didn't they have? What works and what doesn't work? And what, how can we teach them in the best way that we know that they can learn what strategies how can i scaffold this how can i break it apart how can i do this step by step and how can i make that a routine so that they will get to that and they will you know understand and so um the, in our area where we live we are being studied nationally because our children outperform the children across the united states and um, and they're outperforming them. And I think it really has to do with the most awesome educators that just won't give up. Thank you. And I agree. I believe it, we really can do lots. So um, another question here is, can you recommend any resources for finding example words to address the six syllable types? Like any li any lists that would have good words that are useful? Lists that would have good words. Um, I have to think about that one. Um, you know, you're asking about resources. So I, you know, I think, well, okay. So this, these are the things you have to keep in mind. You know, Ken was mentioning how we go. So every, like when we teach, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, people, the school districts buy a lot of these programs, right? And um, I think when you're doing that, what you have to be careful of is, you know, instead of just getting a list, well, now I'm teaching, like, let's look at what letters and sounds they've learned. And from those, let's design the words that would apply to the syllable types. Do you see what I'm saying? Because if you just get a list, if you didn't teach me explicitly, oh, this was the letter and it's sound. Oh, here's the letter and it's sound. And it's, here's the syllable pattern that we're going to be working with and integrating that. So depending on that scope and sequence, then I can make words from those letters that would fit into that pattern. That's great advice. Yeah. So stuff that comes from the content area. I, I, I would be very, I would be very cautious about just getting a, just a generic list instead, like, what are we teaching right now? What do they know? And how does that apply to the syllable patterns? The syllable mm -hmm. So that, so yeah. that when you give them that it's a hundred percent decodable, hundred percent mm -hmm. Read. And when we're talking about the decodable and decodable text, you know, it's, it's very hard. And I, I do want to talk about that, you know, we're not saying that this is rich literature here, but what we are saying is that we can, uh, we can enhance and deepen and make, you know, that kind of instruction a little bit more in depth by thinking about the phonology, thinking about the morphology, thinking about, you know, the syntax or the multiple meaning that that word might even have and just adding to that phonics instruction so it's not an isolation. No, it becomes both a scaffolding tool and a confidence tool for the kids. It's almost also becoming a, like a meta-linguistic skill for them. This is how I really see it because if I do that so much as a routine where I'm bringing in those features, the children are already expecting that. So they're preparing, oh, she's going to ask me about, you know, that there's any word parts in here. She's going to ask me about the syllable division pattern. She's going to ask me about that, you know, part of speech and how it can be used in the sentence. And, and she's going to ask me about that spelling pattern. And so they start to think in that manner and they start to really incorporate that as a routine and think in more depth about the words that they're reading, writing, and spelling. So we do, I know we probably have a few more questions um, and I, we will always take your questions and we can definitely uh, put them into a worksheet. We send that out to Elsa, Elsa answers them and we add things to the Padlet as many as we can. 
Um, I'm sure Dr. Neeser will do that as well if we send them on to him. So we are so honored um, to, to have been able to, through patent, to have been able to host uh, Dr. Cardina Hagen and Ken Neeser. We are so glad they could join us today. We were joined um, by uh, Dr. Antonio Fierro as well, which is kind of a, is a silent honor. So we were very excited yeah. to see him on the call. I know he's shaking his head. Um, but I want to thank both my patent colleagues, Kirsten DeRoche and Amy Cavalier. And on behalf of, uh, on behalf of uh, patent, Dr. Pam Kasser is so grateful that all of you have joined us and continue to join us through this series. Next week, chapter six um, will be coming and we are very excited to see you then. Kirsten will launch a poll. That poll needs to be done um, for you to be able to receive Act 48 credit. Um, and if, like I said, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and we will make sure that we send those on to the presenters.